Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about some, this is like a fun paper, but we're here for fun, so that's good. Um, this is not, there's no sort of major vulnerabilities here, which is good. Um, so we'll just have some fun. Um, the sort of uh, setting for this work is, this is kind of the theme of like a lot of my research. So you guys are all familiar with the law of large numbers, right? That these sort of um, in statistics, you, the average behavior converges almost surely to the expected value as the number of samples increases, you know, kind of um, you expect things to essentially converge this way. So there is a sort of counterpoint to this law, which was formulated by Diaconis and Mosteller, um, which is that when a sample size is large enough, any outrageous thing is likely to happen. Right? So if you want to show the existence of some kind of um, strange behaviors, um, then uh, you just collect enough data points and you will find some weird outliers. Then, okay, so in the cryptographic context, I would like to formulate a cryptographic law of truly large numbers, which is that if you're given samples from enough independent cryptographic implementations, any outrageous vulnerability is likely to be present. So this is essentially, um, this is my conjecture. I conjecture this based off of a number of data points, which is essentially my publication record. So this is my form, you know, <laughs> this is how I got tenure. I don't know about you guys. So, <laughs> um, so in that spirit, uh, this, paper, this work, uh, which I should mention is joint with Joachim Breitner, who is at Dfinity, um, is taking advantage of this observation. So um, I guess it was sort of nice that we got an introduction to elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman in the last talk, so now we're gonna talk about um, ECDSA in this talk. Uh, so we don't care about the elliptic curve aspect at all, we just care about the DSA aspect. Uh, but most people are using ECDSA and not finite field DSA, so we'll push ahead with elliptic curves. So ECDSA, we have some global parameters, we have an elliptic curve E, we have some generator point which has order N, your private key is some integer. Um, your public key is, you know, that integer times your generator point. Uh, we also don't really care about those details. So in order to sign a message, you hash it, possibly in some complicated way. Did you know that most ECDSA implementations hash the message twice? It's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> or one bit less secure than, than once? It's, yeah, it's, it's a little odd. Um, I did not know this until doing this paper, for whatever reason. So um, you learn amazing things. Okay, so uh, you hash the message, and we really, we, we don't care about the details of that. That doesn't really come into this. So we'll just say the message hashed. We're gonna treat it as an integer H, and we don't really care. So um, each signature, so the ECDSA, the way it was originally written, it is a randomized signature scheme. So you have a per signature nonce, which is really like an ephemeral private key. It's some integer K. This K is extremely important. Uh, as we will see very shortly. And so this should be generated sort of per signature. And then your signature itself is a pair of values R and S. R is the X coordinate of K times your generator point. And this S value is computed as written down K inverse times the hash of the message plus the private key times this R value mod N. So that's just an integer. And for our purposes, it is useful that like this is just an integer and this is done using normal integer modular arithmetic. So we don't care about like all of this elliptic curve garbage. We can ignore that part because that's hard and confusing. So, okay. As much, many of you pro in this room probably know, um, as I said, the value of K is extremely important. So this K must remain secret for all of the signatures you ever generate or else your long-term secret key D is revealed and using basic integer arithmetic, you just like invert this equation, okay? Very straightforward. Like good, good undergrad intro crypto like exercise probably. Um, you can amplify this a little bit. This is also super well known. If this secret uh, nonce K is ever reused to sign two distinct messages uh, with different hashes H1 and H2, then it is trivial to compute this value of K. Um, basically by solving two equations with two unknowns. And then you get this value of K, and then using the sort of equation on the previous slide, then you compute the long-term secret key, and then you're, you're done. So this 
comes up over and over again, random number generation issues, blah, blah, blah. This is well-known flaw. People have been explaining it for a long time, okay? Also a fun undergrad project. The thing that we are going to be playing with in this talk is kind of an amplification of this, maybe, but it's much more complicated. So um, this, these nonces must be generated sort of perfectly uniformly at random, or else uh, if they haven't been, we can possibly use a number of signatures to compute the long-term secret key D. So, and the way this works is we essentially have some nice linear relations that we can dump into a lattice. There's also an algorithm that uses Fourier analysis. We're gonna ignore that for the purposes of this talk. So we dump this into a lattice and then it, the secret key is just spat out. Okay. And kind of the high level version of these attacks is that if um, these secret nonces K, I are small, then the system of equations likely has only one solution and the lattice, mat, like lattices can magically find it. Um, and if they are not small, then I don't know, other, other, there are other kinds of biases that, that can be exploited. So that's the big picture of, of what we're doing here. Um, the sort of formulation of this problem, we're gonna be, uh, we already heard about the hidden number problem invoked once earlier uh, this morning. So, um, the way, that you, the way that we will formulate this problem is that essentially we have a system of equations with some unknowns in the signature nonces and the secret key D. Um, and it looks something like this. These are nice linear equations. We know the coefficients here. And so we're just trying to um, solve for the secret key D. This is a alternative formulation of the hidden number problem, which was um, originally described by Bonnet and Vincadison a while ago, in the context of actually um, breaking Diffie-Hellman um, with bits known. I haven't seen that exploited in the wild, actually, um, which is sort of interesting. Don't Stay here. Yeah. Oh, you know what, when you move around? I like moving around. <laughs> They'll deal with it. That's right. We'll prioritize the people in the room. Um, okay, I've been tied to my podium, tragically. <laughs> <laughs> it's a room full of attackers, what, like, okay. Anyway, so um, this, is, this is where we will briefly get into the scary lattice section. Uh, so half of you will be happy and half of you will be unhappy, um, but it's only a few slides, so then, then everybody can be happy because we'll start breaking things. Okay, so we've already, see, we've already seen some of these lattice constructions. Um, this is all sort of well known, so I will just go through the lattice constructions briefly. So the hidden number problem, um, as I said, the way that I'm thinking about it, we want to find solutions to a set of linear, uh, a system of linear equations that looks something like this, um, where we have unknowns uh, k1 through km and the secret key d. And for the, for the moment, we're going to say that all of the ki's are small, so they're less than some bound capital B um, in absolute value. So the, if you read Bonet and McAdison's paper, um, they construct a lattice basis that looks something like this. Um, so you have um, your modulus N on the diagonal, and then you um, have uh, your, one of your, one set of coefficients kind of along the bottom row, and then you want to solve the closest vector problem with a target vector um, that consists of the other set of coefficients, and it just so happens that once you find the closest lattice vector, conveniently the distance will consist of a vector of all the nonces. So you expect this to be small since we said the nonces are all small, and so then this is just sort of spat out the solution and we can solve for the nonces. Okay, you can, you can work out how well this works. Uh, we don't have, if you actually try to implement this, um, you know, solving CVP is annoying, we have, um, if you just want to like press a button, um, it's much easier to find short vectors than closest vectors, unless if you're super lazy. So what everybody who is doing side channel attacks and stuff does um, now is basically sort of embed this lattice into one dimension larger lattice, and then uh, you can just find a short vector and it will just spit out the answer for you and so you don't even have to like back solve for anything. So, um, here we've just sort of 
added the target vector to the bottom and added some scaling factors, and it will just spit out the private key as the shortest vector. So that's cool. Um, so this is what we are doing. There's a lot of papers actually that get these scaling factors. I'm gonna get off the stage again, okay. There's a bunch of papers that get these scaling factors wrong, actually, which is kind of interesting. Um, okay. But the only thing that matter, that means is that like, you have to look hard, a little bit harder for the, uh, the secret key. Okay, so this works. How well does this work? Well, we do a little bit of back of the envelope lattice math, ignoring all of the uh, approximation factors because we're only dealing with really small lattices here. Um, so the dimension of our lattice is, say, the number of signatures that we have plus two. The determinant is whatever this is. It depends on the bound and the modulus. Um, so ignoring the approximation factors because the largest lattice that we look at is like 40 dimensions. Um, if we use the LLL or BKZ lattice reduction algorithms, we should find some vector that is approximately determinant of the lattice to the one over dimension. Um, and we're looking for a vector with length that's basically square root of m times whatever our bound is. And if we plug that in and solve, then we get that the log of our bound should be less than that. And if you want to put in the uh, approximation factor for lattice reduction, then that adds like a little term here. Okay, but generally the thing that we care about <laughs> is that um, as, we, uh, as we increase the number of signatures, we expect this to grow towards log n, but never actually reach it. Okay. So this means that our bound, you know, it starts relatively small, so we expect it to, to start like n over two for, um, for two signatures, and then grow to um, approach, but never quite reach n, the length of n. So um, the original Bonin and Kettison paper, they cared about the limiting behavior, so um, you can reach that limit essentially, um, or you, you can't really get past setting m equals square root of log n. Uh, if we care more, uh, much more about concrete parameters, so with two signatures, we, um, we get a pretty good success rate with, um, and we specialize for a 256-bit curve at, um, curve, so we have a 256-bit n, so the length of a small nonce that we can solve for with two signatures is 128 bits. This has some failure rate. Um, with three signatures, we can solve for 170-bit nonce. With four signatures, we can solve for 190-bit nonce, and so on and so forth. I got these empirically. Um, so, yeah. And the point at which lattice reduction starts to get sort of too slow to run millions of times is like say 40 dimensional lattices, so we stop there with, so we can solve for 248 bit nonces with a 40 dimensional lattice. Yeah? Sure, do you wanna to come to the mic? Okay. So in order for this to be solvable though, you need, the pro you need a property of these nonces that they are, you keep saying small. that they're short, yes. or they're small. Yes. So, this is a little different from the way I normally think of this, where the problem is that the nonces have like a few bits that are predictable. Mm -hmm. So okay. if, the nonce, if the nonces have a few bits that are predictable, then you, have, you just add the term of like the most significant bits, and then you have like the rest okay. of it is this short piece. Okay, so it would have to be specific bits. It wouldn't just be that there's something about them that's slightly distinguishable or something. It would have to be like some specific bits are biased. Yeah, okay. so with the, with the lattice attacks, basically if you have a side channel attack that's giving you some predictable bits, you can say shift them to the most significant bits and then you have a small piece that is not predictable or that's not predictable, that's what you're solving for and then you just add the term that corresponds to the bits that you do know. Okay. And you have to know where they are. Okay, thanks. So, yeah. Fourier analysis is a little bit, um, works a little bit differently, but we are specializing to the lattice attacks. This is great, we're like breaking all the rules here. Um, okay, uh, a few variants of this. So um, we don't necessarily have to have most significant bits all zeros. Um, we can solve for most significant bits known and this, or not, not known, but the same uh, by adding one more signature. So, <laughs> um, Say we have two nonces that are, have most significant bits that are the same, um, but we don't know what they are. We just know that they're the same. We can subtract them and then the difference, we can subtract the signatures and subtracting the signatures gives you a difference of nonces that's gonna be all, the, all zeros. And so now we're back in the short nonce case. 
So that, that is totally straightforward. So we can just add, if, if for some reason somebody has generated a bunch of signatures with most significant bits all the same, we can just subtract one from all the rest of them and solve, and then we're done. So we've just added one more signature to the number of signatures we need to solve for. And if we can also do pretty easily the least significant bits case, um, or middle bits, but we didn't even bother looking at that. Um, it works the same, so you can subtract your uh, signatures, which results in subtracting the nonces, which gives you, say, least significant bits uh, that are all zeros, and then we can multiply by a power of two to shift those known least significant bits to the most significant bits, and then we get the same case as before of a short unknown sequence of bits. So is everybody on board with our lattice techniques so we have a magic box, we can dump a bunch of signatures in and then it will spit out the private key. That's the part that we care about. So that is the end of the scary lattice section. We are done with math for this talk. <laughs> now, now we start breaking stuff. All right, so fun times. Where could we possibly find billions of ECDSA keys and signatures, many of them generated by amateur enthusiasts? <laughs> Cryptocurrencies, this is so great. <laughs> so um, I, wore, I wore my themed shirt today. Um, this, was, this shirt is not my fault, I'm just wearing it. Um, so, okay, unfortunately we do have to worry about some of the details of the way that cryptocurrencies use cryptography. Um, in order to implement this stuff. And this caused a huge amount of grief. You have no idea how complicated this is unless you've tried to do it, in which case, like, I'm with you in our shared um, sort of suffering. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple all use the same elliptic curve uh, for ECDSA. Um, SecP 256K1, widely known weird choice. Uh, so the way, like, sort of the cartoon version of the way that they use it is that the sender is signing some hash of a transaction, um, and this gets recorded on the blockchain. Chain block. Um, <laughs> and sort of published to the internet. So um, identities are addresses, and these addresses are hashes of a public key. Um, which is interesting because the hashes are both like a cryptographic hash and it loses information. So in fact, if you sort of parse the blockchain uh, and you see a bunch of hashes um, and, or you see a bunch of addresses, you don't actually know the public keys until an address sends currency somewhere else by, and generates a signature, um, which, is, which is interesting. So there can be lots of... Uh, cryptocurrency associated with an address ingoing, but until it generates a signature itself with an outgoing transaction, um, we are cryptographically, we have our cryptographic hands tied because we can't do anything with the address itself. Um, so we are, we can only look at addresses that have already spent money. Uh, so, okay, so these transactions are recorded on each currency's blockchain, um, which is convenient for the attacker, everything is public. Uh, so if you want to, say, start analyzing the cryptography, um, you can download a client, you can sync the blockchain, and you can start parsing and extracting the signatures. Um, and there's a star here, because this is way more annoying in practice than it sounds. How many of you have tried to do this? Is it like painful and a grief inducing? It, it, like this is, I have no idea why it's so complicated. Like the way that, um, and I should say that um, my co-author Joachim was the one who did kind of this last part. <laughs> and I was just like, can you please send me signatures? Like this is, um, cause the way that Bitcoin like generates hashes of transactions is incredibly complicated and it's like changed. And so the only way that like, <laughs> we could figure out to do this was to just like modify the client to have it like print stuff out because uh, like while it was validating the signature because it was just impossible to compute otherwise. Um, and let's see, are there other weirdnesses? I think, I think that's that. For the, well, there, there's, a, there's a few more. So, okay. But the, the cartoon version of this is that you can just download the blockchain, you get a bunch of signatures and, and it's great. The non-cartoon version, and um, the non-cartoon version is that if you start looking at all of the like 
Bitcoin analysis libraries that, are, that people have published out there. For some reason, they assume that people don't want to actually examine the signatures so they don't make it easy to get, get to them. And they, for some reason, they assume that you don't actually want the concrete value of a hash, of like the hash of the transaction. Why would anybody ever want that? So it's hard to get. Um, anyway, okay. So this, like much research, so like what you know, Matt was talking about earlier today, where there's like a great little cryptographic component, and then there's like months of engineering. This is like the months of engineering for this, this work. Um, so, all right. Once we have a convenient way of extracting the signatures, here is our cryptanalysis program. So we will scrape the blockchains. So the Bitcoin blockchain, when we were looking at it, had a billion signatures in it, which is pretty cool. We can group them by a public key that generated each signature. Uh, so this resulted in, say, 60 million public keys for Bitcoin that had generated more than one um, signature. Then we can check for the two attacks that we, we talked about. So the easy attack is checking for repeated nonces, which is you can just look for a duplicated R value in the signature. Um, or you can also look for lattice attacks um, on the bias nonces, as we described. Um, we spent about 50 CPU years uh, running these. Um, and at that point, either you're rich and you can retire to some island without an extradition treaty, or you are not rich, in which case you publish a paper. And I am here, so <laughs> you can see what happened. Um, all right. So, um, sort of the details of what we ran, um, we clustered the signatures uh, by uh, the public key. Um, we selected random subsets of two, three, four, and 40 signatures and optimistically just ran the attacks for the short prefix and, and suffix nonces. Um, so um, kind of if the collection of signatures that we chose happened to be vulnerable, we would get the private key. If not, we would get nothing. Uh, and so there, I want to add one little extra weird snag in the way that these uh, cryptocurrencies generate signatures, which is that um, they're really worried about having unique signatures. So um, fact about ECDSA, the signatures uh, R and S and R and negative S both validate. Um, and Bitcoin makes the signatures unique by choosing the smaller of S and negative S mod N to make them unique. Um, this has the effect of negating K, like the, the nonce. Uh, so for the prefix and suffix attacks where we had to do the, the um, subtraction, we actually have to brute force the, the signs of all the nonces, which is like super annoying. <laughs> Maybe there's a clever way to get around this. Maybe Fourier analysis gets around this, but uh, we did not do that. So there's some brute forcing going on. Okay, so what did we find? Okay, so I'll start with the easy case, which is the repeated nonce K values. So this has been analyzed many times by academics since 2013. Um, uh, so we'll just sort of summarize what you find. So uh, here is, so the X axis is um, signatures over time with repeated values. And then the size of the little circles there is the number of signatures um, on that date with repeated, with a, a repeated nonce. So Bitcoin, uh, out of the billion signatures, two and a half million of them have a non-unique K. Uh, those come from 1,300 unique keys. Um, Ethereum, there's a smaller number of keys uh, and smaller number of signatures, and, and Ripple also. Um, there, is, there are multiple attackers who are systematically scanning the Bitcoin blockchain and stealing all the money from anybody who produces a uh, signature with a non-unique nonce. So there was no money in the um, <laughs> Bitcoin ones. Uh, there, there actually were funds in the Ethereum and Ripple cases, so people were not looking for this yet in Ethereum and Ripple. Um, you may notice that there's a interesting something interesting going on here with one of the values. So I'll talk about that shortly. Okay. Um, what did we find with the lattice attacks? You might expect that we would find nothing because of course who would be stupid enough to like make a mistake there? But in fact, we found a number of things. So the Y axis is the sort of format of the nonce that we found, prefixes or suffixes in the length of the random part. Um, and so we actually found 
6,000 signatures from 300 keys in Bitcoin. These contained, contained 0 0.008 Bitcoin, which was, I think, 30 something dollars. Um, and Ethereum, there were five signatures from one key, they contained some Ether. Um, and we also found some SSH keys that uh, were vulnerable due to this attack. So I will now go through a few stories. So uh, what is going on with this giant circle here? So this value. So 99.9% .9 of the repeated Bitcoin nonce values are that, that number. Um, this is n minus one over two, where n is the order of the elliptic curve used for Bitcoin. Um, and it is, weird fact, the x coordinate of one half times the generator point has 166 bits instead of 256. So all of these signatures, um, the r value is shorter by 11 bytes. I, I'm really enjoying <laughs> John Kelsey's expression right now. Um, for those of you at home, it is, it is amazing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, why are people doing this? Well, apparently the suggestion to do this in the context of Bitcoin and like well, the reason that people are generating these, these signature values is that Greg Maxwell suggested this to clear dust transactions, so like sort of small amounts of cryptocurrency left in particular addresses. And I guess you pay for the length of your transaction, and so by having a signature that is shorter by 11 bytes, you save a small amount in transaction fees. Okay, that's why people are doing this. But the bigger question is, why does this value have this property? And um, somehow the Bitcoin people figured this out and are taking advantage of it, but then like, this isn't actually like a documented property of this curve. Um, it seems to be an artifact from the way it was generated. And nobody I have talked to know, like, knows why it has this property. But it is the case that a number of the, the other um, curves of this type also have this property. Um, some of them produce the same value and some of them have uh, kind of variants of this value. Uh, it also turns out that the, the generation procedure for these curves was not documented. Um, so this, this, is, this tells us something perhaps, I mean, so I've talked to a number of people about this and it is an ongoing mystery, um, but if you, we are discovering more things as, as we go along. So this is, this is telling us something about how these curves is generate, are generated properly, probably, because you would never expect this to happen at, at random. Um, is it the same value for multiple curves, or is it just, yes. there is a... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you may notice that 166 bits is intriguingly close to 160 bits, which is the length of, say, a SHA-1 hash of something. But it's not 160 bits, it's 166 bits. So they're not just like merely like hashing something and incrementing, it's like hashing and then appending. And uh, like, I can, I can, I can, if people would like to see more, I can show you a little bit of, of what we figured out. But um, so this is fun things that you find when you look at public key infrastructure. So, okay, we will continue on to further fun things that we found. So one of the compromise keys uh, from repeated uh, nonces, uh, we traced to darkwallet.is. We were basically just like Googling um, addresses to figure out what they were because of course there isn't much metadata in Bitcoin itself that would tell us. Uh, so this was part of a three out of five multi-signature address. So that means that you need um, signatures, that, like this, this address is associated with a number of, of uh, keys and you need signatures from at least three of those keys in order to send money out of the address. Um, and this was used for donations to darkwallet.is. Um, at the time that we were looking, this uh, address held a large number of funds, like pretty, pretty significant. Uh, so we thought that they might care about the fact that one of their keys had been compromised. Um, and so I got in contact with one of the authors of this site uh, who, very interesting person. Both of the people are very interesting. Um, cryptocurrency people are strange. Um, so, so I'm 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 chatting with him, and I was like, so can you like tell me how you generated these 
uh, signatures because it would be interesting to know what implementation it was um, and we could like sort of trace this down um, and he said it's either me I was calculating the signatures manually or my friend who was working on dark wallet it might have been an earlier version so calculating the signatures manually there's like a lot of money in here and it's just like kind of hand generating ECDSA signatures and oops you forget to seed your, your RNG and, and then you've compromised your key so this is the state of cryptographic software. Um, so some more human factors. Um, so after finding some very small nonces, we brute forced all the 32-bit nonces. Uh, so this compromised 275 signatures from 52 keys. Uh, some of the nonce values that we observed were uh, obviously not randomly generated. Um, so people are <laughs> having fun. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I mean, I guess we could like try to get some confidence values, like if we had some prior here, then we could like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, the, what the, the confidence interval for this is. For, uh, randomness. Anyway, so, okay, um, sort of uh, more like on a slightly more serious note, there, there have been a number of random number generation vulnerabilities uh, that have impacted Bitcoin over several years. Uh, two of the most prominent ones, um, there was a bad vulnerability in Android Secure Random. They were, I think it was not like getting a fresh state on a fork. And so there were a number of repeated nonces and a lot of people got large numbers of funds stolen uh, because of repeated nonces generated from um, Android Bitcoin wallets in 2013. Um, there was also a vulnerability um, in the blockchain.info uh, wallet um, from 2015. Uh, I think the vulnerability started in 2015. Um, there was uh, an issue where they were seeding from random.org and random.org did a re redirect from HTTP to HTTPS. And so um, the blockchain.info uh, was pulling the, the data from here, but then when this redirect happened, they were just getting the 403 redirect rather than the actual output um, that was supposed to be coming from random.org. And so um, this resulted in a constant seed for the random number generator. So um, we can see, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, these, these were two of the like, most highly publicized random number generator vulnerabilities in Bitcoin wallets but um, these don't really seem to quite line up with, with what's going on here. So um, there's clearly a lot, a lot of other stuff happening. Okay. I would like to talk about sort of the small nonces, what is going on there. So most of the small nonces that we found were in like one cluster of 64-bit nonces, almost all of which were multi-signature uh, addresses. And they seem to be confined to a particular set of dates. But this was like all of the metadata that we had. We like looked for the addresses, we could not figure this out. Um, and so actually after we posted our paper online, um, Greg Maxwell wrote to us and he's like, based off of the set of characteristics, I think I know what caused this. And so um, it turns out that uh, there was this uh, library written by BitPay, this uh, BitPay organization. And when they, um, they made an update to their library, uh, update sign function to use elliptic, um, in which they gave the wrong length of buffer um, for the length of the nonce that they were, the, the length of the random nonce that they were generating. And this uh, update corresponds exactly with the beginning of the generation of these nonces. This was fixed relatively quickly. This was fixed only a few weeks later um, to have the correct length of, of nonce. So what is going on here? Well. Um, so I've, I've marked um, the two dates here. So this is, this is the beginning date and this is the, the date in which it was fixed. But by this point, um, the data which had been fixed, this library had already been forked and was be being used in a number of other projects and the bug fix did not make it into these downstream projects. And so it continued to be used um, for, for quite a while afterward before being fixed. So, yes. Um, I think this says something about the fragility of ECDSA in general. Okay, um, this may also be a familiar story to everybody who's tried to report a vulnerability or fix a vulnerability in a product. Right? 
So, okay, um, more fun. We can, um, we tried looking for more 64-bit nonces. Since our lattice attacks, we were just sort of running them on a random subset of, of signatures. We were not guaranteed to find all of the vulnerable keys. But a 64-bit nonce, you can actually uh, compute outright if you want. Um, so using um, Polydor or Baby Step Giant Step, you could basically compute a 64-bit nonce in, in 32, um, in two to the 32 work. Uh, two to the 32 work times a billion signatures is not feasible still. Um, so we altered the parameters a little bit um, to try to, to search for this. So essentially we uh, did a pre-computation. Uh, we pre-computed a um, hash table of two to the 39 elements. This took up 2.2 terabytes. Uh, this was sized because the largest uh, amount of RAM that I had on a single machine was three terabytes. So this was intended to fit into RAM. Um, and then we pre-computed a 2 to the 32 lookup table of the logs of these elements. Um, so this took a few days on a few hundred nodes um, of my cluster to pre-compute. Um, so then this let us uh, do 2 to the 25 work to look up a uh, signature. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the lookup was still, 2 to the 25 should be feasible, but because you're looking up um, in this huge amount of, of memory, there is no caching possible. And so um, it turns out to actually be pretty slow. It's about 10 seconds per lookup um, on our machines to do this. So uh, we ran it for a couple weeks uh, and checked a random subset of 140,000 signatures. Um, and. The conclu tentative conclusion that we have is that 64-bit nonces are not much more common than the ones that we found. So we found most of them, probably. Okay, so other fun. Um, here is a set of signatures that were generated by SSH servers that had a shared 32-bit suffix. So you can see this value in blue is shared among all of these signatures. So what is this? If you Google this value, it turns out to be one of the uh, round constants for SHA-2. With changed byte order, of course, but. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how you like, I, I mean, I assume somebody was trying to like use like SHA-2 to, to um, generate their nonces, which is like a good uh, procedure, but I don't know how you screw up your SHA-2 implementation so that you get like a fixed value um, in the least significant bits of this. <laughs> so, interesting. Uh, we also have no idea what implementation this is. Um, so the final sort of screw up that I want to talk about is um, probably memory unsafe code. So there were 54 signatures with a shared 128-bit suffix. Um, and the shared suffixes, you can look. Um, so they've been grouped by suffix here. Um, and you can see that actually, uh, if you compare these to the secret keys that were associated with the nonces, the 128 least significant bits of the nonce were the same as the 128 most significant bits of the secret key. Which is weird. Um, so you might hypothesize that you know, a possible explanation is that somebody writes some code where they get the length of the, of the secret key wrong and they accidentally like sort of overwrite a buffer um, and or sort of cop start copying things into the um, the key, I, I don't know. Um, but the thing that's really interesting about this case is that um, these signatures, when we looked at the addresses that were um, where the money was being uh, transferred out of, a lot of them had been published on the web somewhere. So they were associated with mem like memory, wall mem memory wallets that um, had easy to guess passwords, um, like. Android or something, um, or they were contained in like uh, example code from various implementations uh, that had like just you know here's a sample address and here's how you generate like a transaction to send to that address and people had like sent money to that address presumably copying the sample code and then <laughs> someone had like then 
taken the money out of that address because the, the secret key was there. And so our hypothesis is that these transactions were actually generated by an attacker who is stealing money from these vulnerable addresses that have been revealed somehow uh, already on the web. Um, and that the attacker's code is the one with the memory safety vulnerabilities. So I don't feel that bad about sort of dropping O'Day here. Um, so there is a simple and well-known countermeasure to everything that I have been talking about, and this has been known for years, uh, which is to use determinic, ter deterministic ECDSA. You can generate your secret nonce by you know, hashing or HMAC or whatever, your secret key and your message hash. And probably like basically any combination of this is essentially secure, if, and there's an RFC that um, does this, all of the official libraries for the cryptocurrencies that we looked at, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple already do this and have been doing it for years. So everything that we have been talking about is not from the official core libraries of these cryptocurrencies. Um, Ed25519 builds in deterministic non-generation from the start. ECDSA probably should have, but it didn't. So sort of backing up a little bit, um, sort of what are we doing here? Um, Essentially, we spend a lot of time thinking about cryptographic assumptions, like as cryptographers, there's these explicit assumptions like discrete log is hard, a hash function behaves like a random oracle. You can argue about these, maybe they're secure, maybe they're not, but you can actually sort of, um, this is what we talk about like at, at conferences like this. But there's a lot of implicit assumptions in cryptography also, like the implementation is correct, the random number generator is functioning, the code implements all the required validation checks. We've seen this be violated multiple times today. Um, and so like, it seems useful to say, to think more about these implicit assumptions when we're designing cryptographic schemes. Um, so I would sort of hypothesize that essentially fragility under human error should be a cryptographic design consideration. Uh, we know that developers will make mistakes. How do you minimize the damage? Um, one idea is to tie security to basic functionality, like say Ed25519 is trying to do, that like the, your scheme is not correctly implemented if you don't do this. Um, and we'll see how that, this go, like, goes moving forward. Uh, and sort of in general, there's sort of a tension between diversity of having like a bunch of different primitives and implementations and baseline security. So uh, what we would like is to have like one library that's like really great, it's been like formally verified, it's been vetted. Um, but then if that library breaks, then like everything breaks all at once. So then you might think, well, okay, maybe it's good to have diversity, like not everything would break at once, but then you get kind of this long tail of implementations, which is what I've been exploiting in this talk. So um, here is my last slide. So we have other stuff in the paper, like tables with numbers and more examples of bad implementations. Uh, this paper was at Financial Crypto this year, um, and it is on ePrint. Uh, so thank you. OK, thank you very much, Nadia. Um, there were already some questions. I can imagine that there are other questions after this as well. So uh, anybody question or everybody wants to go to enjoy the reception? OK. Uh, so maybe I ask about uh, this uh, SHA-2 uh, overflow or what was it? Can you imagine uh, that it could be some overflow or boundary violation that uh, could be uh, produced in, uh, in the code or something like that? Have you analyzed it or is yeah. it in the last round? Yeah. Possibly. I okay. mean, I guess if these sort of like, but I mean, it's unclear like why sort of these values would be sort of allocated next to the value that you're producing. I, yeah. I think you run over with your fixed volume. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if you, I guess if you like allocated this whole table, and then like the next thing that's allocated is like the buffer you're copying, and then you, and then um, it's the wrong length, and so you accidentally like copy over into the last value. Yeah, um, maybe. Okay. Okay. So we have we have no idea what what this library is. Um, okay. So I mean, you can rerun the calculation and find the same list of hosts and play with them maybe uh, without violating the CFA. And, um, but yeah, we don't know what they are. Okay, okay. okay uh, so I would say thank you very much for attending uh, this workshop and enjoy the reception, the second workshop day.
uh, tomorrow and the rest of the conference. So thank you very much for everything.